So welcome to the last substantial class. This is the last class where I'm going to deliver any new material. Uh, there will be one more class tomorrow, but we're just going to do review and exam prep. That's all. Uh, and enough people came to me and said that they had unmovable commitments on Tuesday that I'm not going to take attendance tomorrow. So I hope that doesn't cause problems. I guess that shouldn't cause problems any, for anybody because you're not trying to get a number of attendances. You're just trying to not get too non-attendances, right? So that should be OK. OK, so uh, I'm impressed with how many people made it. I thought more of you would have done the math and thought, oh, I have, two, I have uh, attended enough that I don't have to show up to this class. So I'm glad that some of you have shown up. This is great. Um, and there's not going to be that much new material today either. It's, uh, I mean, you've already handed in your major argument analyses, so you'd be hurt and upset if I like, here's a whole bunch of stuff about adequacy that I'd never told you and you should have known for your thing. So really what we're going to do today is just some uh, fallacies. That's the main, the main bulk of our work today. But uh, you do still have to think about adequacy in the future because there's going to be uh, one argument analysis on the exam. So maybe the first thing to do is to talk about the exam. So uh, the exam consists of 50 points. It's, two, it's a two-hour exam, uh, and the first 10 are multiple choice. The uh, third quiz bears considerable structural similarity to the multiple choice section on the exam. So looking at the, sh the kind of questions that I'm asking you on the third quiz is excellent preparation for the multiple choice section of the exam. It's like the same kind of questions, but different content. All right? So there's that. That's the first 10. Uh, I believe there's a handful of uh, questions about fallacies. So the questions that I'm going to ask you in that section are, here's a, here's a short passage. Tell me whether this commits a certain fallacy or not and why. And basically what I'm looking for there is for you to show me that you understand what would constitute committing the fallacy. Right? So you're going to explain whether you think it commits it or not, and then explain why. And I think those are four points apiece, and there's three of them, I believe. So hopefully the, the structure of that is clear enough. Like on all the fallacies that we've talked about so far, what I've tried to emphasize for you is that it's not always obvious whether somebody's committing the fallacy. So just given a couple of sentences, it won't be completely obvious whether somebody's committed the fallacy. Your job is to identify what you would need to know to determine whether they would, were committing the fallacy, right? What it hangs on. So we're going to do that as we did that last time in class. We're going to do that again in this class. Just look at a passage and talk about whether it commits a fallacy. Those ones, I'm just asking you to do that again. I think there are four or five short definitions where we're just talking about like key course terms, central terms from the course, and you're just telling me what they mean. Fairly straightforward definition section. Then there is uh, an, an, an there's two sort of argument analyses. One, the first one is short and is just diagram the argument. So you don't have to actually analyze the argument in the sense of saying whether it's good or not. You just draw me, write, rewrite uh, the argument in premise form and conclusion, draw me a diagram. That's for, that should be totally straightforward for you. You've all practiced that beyond your tolerances probably. Uh, and then the final one is an argument analysis. So I'm, I'll give you a short argument, considerably shorter than the editorial. So the editorial was 500 words or so. The argument I'll have you analyze is around 125 words. So it's much shorter than the one on your, uh, on the one that you've been working on all this time. But you'll use all the same skills that you used on the argument analysis on that. So what I want you to do is rewrite it in premises, draw me a diagram and then tell me about its the acceptability, relevance, and adequacy. OK? And that's the exam. So the plan is to have no surprises. Nothing in this should be surprising or shocking. There are no trick questions. There's no like out of the blue stuff, I hope. I hope it should be all straightforward tests of whether you've been paying attention in class, digesting the material, and learning it sort of at the, at the level that we're looking for. Okay. So, any further questions about the structure of the exam? Oh, uh, paper dictionaries will be allowed again. Uh, no other aids, but you're allowed to bring a paper dictionary. 
I'm not having you to define anything, but nonetheless, we're, we're still not testing your knowledge of what words mean. We're testing your ability to analyze arguments. Okay. It should be, I mean, the challenge should be in executing the skills that you've got, not like understanding what the question is. So hopefully the whole, the structure of the exam will be straightforward enough. Uh, Michael tells me that he's marking the argument analyses, possibly as we speak. Uh, I can't make any promises for when he'll get them back. Uh, hopefully before the exam. He's hoping to get them done before the exam, but there's quite a lot of them and he's taking his time with them, so we shall see. I'll, I'll send out a message about that. If and when he's sort of done, I'll send out a message about that. Okay. Any further questions about course mechanics stuff? Yeah. Just out of curiosity, would you be able to distribute the, the grades for argument analysis if you don't agree with it? Um, I suppose you could. I suppose you could. Well, we'll have the opportunity to do that. Um, yes, I mean, you can email me. Uh, that, would be, that would be the method, yeah. yeah. How do you pick them up? How do you pick them up? Uh, I believe he'll upload the files. Oh, you can scan it and upload it? Well, no, he would have made comments in, in the file. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't hand, yeah, you didn't hand me any pieces of paper. You you uploaded it to Utor Submit, and so he'll he will upload a comments file to Utor Utor Submit, and there should be some comments on how you did and why why you got the mark that you did. Okay. Okay. You guys, feeling tired? I'm tired. We, we made it though, we're almost at the end of the semester. Okay, so let's, let's do this and then we're done. So we'll talk about adequacy. So uh, I really have very little to say about adequacy itself because everything that I've said so far about acceptability and relevance is everything that you need to know about ad adequacy. Adequacy is just the product of acceptability and relevance. If, you're, if your premises are completely acceptable, and they include all of the relevant facts, then your argument is completely adequate. To the degree that one or the other of those fails to be the case, then your argument will be less than completely adequate. Most arguments are, of course. And that's, I mean, that's more or less it. Uh, a couple of provisos, I suppose. Uh, adequacy d depends on the strength of the conclusion. I think I, I, think I said this yesterday, but like, to, to provide an adequate argument for an extremely strong conclusion, uh, it's harder than to provide an adequate argument for a weak conclusion or a conclusion that doesn't claim much. I, I, do, I would warn you, don't call premises adequate. Nothing can be adequate except a whole argument. Okay, so don't tell me that the premise was adequate to explain the conclusion. That's not how adequacy works. Adequacy ranges over only the arguments as a whole, that is, the premise, the conclusion, and the purported relation between them, okay? Uh, so, of course, it depends on the strength of the conclusion, the acceptability of the premises, and the relevance of the premises to the conclusions. Yeah? How about uh, what would you mean with the adequacy of an appeal to uh, So, I don't, in this, in the context of this course, probably better not to, I might have called it that, but probably better not to call that. So an appeal to authority is like a, a move in an argument. Uh, or can it be a whole argument? I suppose it could. If your whole argument is just an appeal to authority, then you can talk about the adequacy of that. Um, but yeah. So you, you, usually we should talk about like how acceptable it is or, or how reasonable it is to appeal to authority in that case, but yeah. Okay. This should be just completely from, if you've been following along, this should all be just fairly straightforward for you. Right, so uh, strong conclusions require relevant, strong and relevant premises. So here's two conclusions, one of which is substantially stronger than the other, and you can see how they would require different premises for the proof. If what you want to prove is that all swans are white, you have to do a lot more work than proving most swans are white. Right? So most swans are white, you can do like a statistical study. You can just sort of look at large populations, many observations, and you can establish that with relative certainty. Whereas all swans are white, you have to somehow show that there are no 
non-white swans, which is a much stronger claim, right? Okay. And one more subtle shade in this, I mean, and this is pretty much the last thing I'm going to say about adequacy as in and of itself. Uh, in actual contexts, you're going to uh, serious conclusions might require stronger premises to be adequate. So, to, for for an argument to be adequate means it's adequate for you to accept the conclusion. And if the conclusion is one that a lot hangs on, then you should require stronger evidence. Like, I see a few dark clouds on the horizon, so I should take an umbrella. The conclusion is not one of great import. Like you could, you might be stuck carrying an umbrella is the worst case scenario in that. But I see a few dark clouds on the horizon, so I should cancel the family reunion we've been planning for months. It's a much larger conclusion, like a much more important conclusion or something like that. Like it's a more serious conclusion. And therefore, you shouldn't really accept this argument because the evidence is not proportionate to the conclusion, right? Just because there's a few dark clouds on the horizon, probably not reason enough to cancel the family reunion. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. Oh, most swans are white. It's much easier to prove, isn't it? All I need is one black swan to prove that not all swans are white. Well, that would make it easier to disprove. Yeah. Or like, to assess the validity of your conclusion, I guess. Uh, yes, but that's not, assessing the validity is different than uh, sort of establishing the conclusion, right? So certainly, yeah, one black swan negates all swans are white. But if you want to prove all swans are white to prove that it's true, then it takes much more evidence. So if you wanted to prove the negation of this, it's, you're, it's even easier than most swans are white. So proving most swans are white is actually kind of hard. You have to have some facts about the total population of swans, right? But if you want to just prove the negation of all swans are white, then you just need one non-white swan. That's super easy. So then don't you need to know uh, whether to assess the validity of the, to understand the proofs, don't you need to assess whether it's true or not? Like, don't you need to know that, okay, if we didn't know all swans were white, right? Right. Uh, then how would you go around proving this? Well, it'd be, it would be super hard. You'd have, to, you'd have to find all of the swans. But wouldn't I be easy to find one black swan to disprove it? Because of course, yeah. So this is, I mean, a universal statement is much easier to disprove than to prove. Of course, this is, if, this, if that's what you're pointing out, then yeah, for sure. For sure. It's way easier to show that it's not the case that all swans are white than it is to show that it is the case. So there's a huge asymmetry in how much effort you have to put because one is a much stronger conclusion than the other, right? So all swans are white is an extremely strong conclusion and you need a bunch of evidence to support it. Whereas not all swans are white is a much weaker conclusion. All you need is exactly one non-white swan. Yeah, so this is, this is just, the, just exactly what we're saying here that strong conclusions require much more evidence to accept as like an ad, or accept, accept the argument as adequate. So you're saying that we assume that the theory is true, right? If we don't know whether it's true or not, we assume it's true and then we, what kind of premises would be required for it to evolve? Well, so a, an argument is meant to establish a conclusion. And the question is, how much evidence do you need to establish the conclusion? So you don't s assume that it's true or false from the beginning. You, you ask, what do I need to know to tell whether this conclusion is true or not? Is there, yeah. Uh, I think that compared to all swans are white, most swans are white is easier to prove because if you've just, you can just cite all of these observed swans. So all swans are white is something that goes beyond like any set of observations, right? So any set of observations is probably going to be insufficient to establish it because there's always the possibility of a non-white swan somewhere. But most swans are white. It is really hard, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, so, but most swans are white. That's easy to establish. You could just go around looking at swans, right? And if you take a, if you have a, if you're confident that your sample is representative, then you can conclude that on, on this basis. So try, try this one. So uh, all cats have four legs versus most cats have four legs. Did you know that about one in 10,000 cats is born with six legs? It's true. About one in 10,000 cats is born with six legs. So I'm highly confident in the claim that most cats have four legs. Highly, highly confident. And my observations are just like all the pictures of cats, all the cats I've ever seen, really strong evidence, I think, for most cats have four legs. 
whereas all cats have four legs is just false. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't looked up this fact about six-legged cats, but it's much harder to prove, right? The universal is just always harder to prove than the generic one, I would say. <laughs> uh, I think somebody asked me it as an example. It was something like they were, they were trying to offer an example of something that's clearly just always true. Cats have four legs. This was the, this was the sort of, uh, it was supposed to be an analytic claim. Isn't it analytic that cats have four legs? And I thought, no, because if you chop off a leg, it's still a cat. And then I looked up how many legs cats have, and <laughs> that's, that's how we got to six-legged cats. It's, it's sad and adorable at the same time. Are they functional? I'm not sure I didn't get that deep into the, deep in the question. It's a, it's a good research project for you. OK, OK. So is this also fairly clear, uh, like how, how important the conclusion is? So let's not confuse this with relevance. But like, if your conclusion is really serious, if it's a life or death question, if it's a question about which lots of resources need to be mobilized or something like that, I don't really know how to capture this in formal terms. The fact that serious, important conclusions need stronger evidence to be, uh, to be established. But it seems to me a very reasonable sort of way of thinking about this. OK with that? OK, great. OK, that was it. OK, that was everything I had to say about adequacy. Um, again, I think once you've got acceptability and relevance and you understand that acceptability times relevance equals adequacy, that's all you need to know about adequacy. It's just how much evidence do you need to bring to bear in order to accept the conclusion of the argument based on the argument. Sorry, not just accept it, but like. I'm, I'm sorry, I should not confuse terms like this. How much evidence do you need? How, in order to accept, uh, acceptability, oh. <laughs> in order to believe the conclusion of the argument is established by the argument. Let me put it that way, but that was brutal. All right, anyway, so acceptability, there it is. And now we're, for the rest of the class, we're just gonna go through uh, appeal to ignorance, slippery slope, and then a handful of causal fallacies. Uh, by no means is this exhaustive. If you look up like list of fallacies, there's just dozens and dozens of them. We could, we could spend months going through them all. Here are some of the most important ones, uh, some of the ones related to adequacy. Uh, and then, then we'll basically be done. Yeah. Appeal to authority? Yeah, the one where uh, everybody likes this show. Oh, right. It's like a clear appeal to a majority, right? Uh, I guess so. I guess so. I don't actually, to be honest, I don't actually know that fallacy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't. And again, philosophers don't really spend a lot of time naming fallacies as, as, as an important part of our discourse. Like, usually we just explain the specific problem with a specific piece of reasoning. Uh, so this is not something that we like, this is not something we focus on as such. Uh, and I, I'll reemphasize that Using the names of these fallacies for yourself can be very helpful. Using them at other people is totally obnoxious and unhelpful. So I strongly recommend that you don't, don't point your finger at somebody and tell them that they're doing appeal to ignorance. They're just going to like you less and listen to you less. So bad for, bad for rhetorical purposes. It's not, it's, a, it's not that you're saying anything untrue. It's just really rude and obnoxious. All right. So appeal to ignorance. And we're going to... We're gonna do the same slightly annoying thing that we did last time, where I tell you that this is a fallacy, and then I'll tell you that it's really hard to tell when somebody's actually committing this fallacy. So the, the slogan here is, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and I will add the proviso, except when it is. Right? So the, the problem here is separating out when appealing to the lack of absence. So this is the, an argument which starts from, there is no evidence to show this thing, therefore that thing doesn't exist. So that's the structure of the argument. And often, that's a fallacy. Sometimes it's not. So let's go through some cases, and we'll try to tease apart when this is an error in reasoning and when it is not. For example, there have never been any confirmed sightings of unicorns, so unicorns don't exist. Fallacy or not a fallacy, and why? Um, well. 
aren't unicorns by definition like mythical creatures? So by definition, they're not supposed to exist? I think that if I saw a horse with a horn on its head, I would go, ah, that's a unicorn. I thought they didn't exist. Rather than saying, that can't be a unicorn. They don't exist by definition. That must be something else. Okay, and why? Okay. Okay. Does anybody think different? So, this fallacy? Does anybody think different? Yeah? No? You? Oh, wow. So, you guys, like, okay, so the only basis that I have for believing that unicorns don't exist is that nobody's ever seen one. This is the, my personal evidence that they don't exist, right? I don't know any other, any other proof that nobody's ever, nobody's ever observed one. I, is, am I wrong in that? Should I, should I just be agnostic about the existence of unicorns on that basis? Or like, well, maybe they're around and just nobody's ever seen one. Yeah. Well, going back to like what I said, like, if you make up some like mythical creature, like, that's, I think, good enough basis to just kind of say that it's you're reasonably certain that it doesn't exist. Okay. Okay. I mean, like, it's like, in your, like, it's like saying, like, Loch Ness monster, like, does Loch Ness monster exist? Because I've never seen it. Like, well, well same thing you said about the black swan. Oh, but I showed you a picture of a black swan. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like, the unicorn is like, I really bet my money on the fact that they don't exist because I've never seen them because I know that and the fact that unicorns were defined, like, by, like, books and stuff. Yeah, Luke? There's a point in time when you could replace unicorns there with, like, so many other things. And sure. You Sure. Actually, they were confirmed sightings. So even if there are no confirmed sightings, it doesn't prove they don't exist. It just proves there's no confirmed sightings. Okay, okay. Let's, let's accept, I propose to accept the idea that the lack of unicorn sightings is not absolute proof that there are no unicorns. However, nonetheless, I'm going to boldly assert that there are none because uh, if there were around, we would have seen them by now. Basically, this is the argument. So this is when it's not an appeal to ignorance if there is no evidence and furthermore, it's reasonable to expect that there would be evidence, right? So I think it's reasonable to expect that in 2017, where everybody's carrying a cell phone camera and we've, cr we've completely surrounded the world with human population, like there's nowhere on this planet we haven't been. We, well, maybe they exist on another planet. So that's, tr that's true. Maybe, maybe unicorns exist on another planet. Who knows? But in this, in this particular planet that we happen to be on, let's restrict our domain of discourse to Earth, uh, I think it's reasonable to say that if there was unicorns, we would have seen them by now. There would be some evidence of their existence. And therefore, I conclude from the lack of unicorn sightings that there are none. I'm sorry if this is breaking your heart. <laughs> Uh, in this case, I would restrict, I'm restricting it to Earth. So we can have different domains of discourse. I'm, we're not stuck in just the universal d domain of discourse. So in this case, let's, let's, there have never been any confirmed sightings of unicorns, so unicorns don't exist on Earth. Let's add that as an implicit clause here. I really did not expect to be arguing for the non-existence of unicorns today. <laughs> Well, that's, so I think this is not the appeal to ignorance fallacy. I think this is not a fallacy. I think this is perfectly good reasoning where we're saying, look, we have no evidence for this thing. And furthermore, if there was, if this thing did exist, we totally should have evidence by now for it. It's totally reasonable to expect that there would be evidence for it if it did exist. Therefore, Probably it doesn't exist. This doesn't get to you to certainty by any means. So this is not a fully adequate argument for the non-existence of unicorns. Maybe there's some and we just haven't seen them yet. Uh, so it's not that we have perfect knowledge of all of the quadrupeds on Earth. We just have a bunch of it. We do have a bunch of evidence about whether they exist or not. Yeah.
Okay. We're an observant, so we can hear it, right? Yep. Would you agree that should have this would be an appeal to policy? So if uh, so Luke, Luke pointed out before that there's tons of stuff about which this basic structure could have been said in the past that's not, that we wouldn't expect now. So like uh, up until the 90s, there had been no observations of planets around any other stars. Like we'd only ever observed the planets orbiting our star. The, the discovery of the actual observation of extrasolar planets is within all of your lifetime. So it would have been true back in 19... 87, that there have never been any confirmed sightings of extrasolar planets, but it would have been an, it would have been an appeal to ignorance to therefore conclude that there are no extrasolar planets. Why? Because well, because it wasn't reasonable to expect that we would have observed them, right? Because we had no, we had no observational power that would have shown them if they were there. Well, yeah, we haven't, we haven't got, we didn't have in the, in the early 90s, we did not have the reasonable expectation that we would have observed it if it was there. Yeah. But wouldn't you only know that you don't have that power at the moment you attain that power? Well, not with, you, not with unicorns. <laughs> I think if I think if you've never run quickly, it's extremely likely that you're unable to do so. <laughs> like, I've never I've never run a marathon, but the fact that I've never run a marathon to me is extremely good evidence that I would not be able to run a marathon. Uh, yeah. So there are cases in which we can reasonably expect that there would be evidence, and the lack of that evidence tells you something. It is evidence. It is not conclusive evidence. Right? So the lack of evidence is, does not close off the question permanently and forever. However, it is a piece of evidence, isn't it? Like, what other base, on what other basis do you all believe that there are no unicorns? So, supposing that you believe that there are no unicorns. Yeah, they fly. It's just like uh, you, th you think of Pegasus. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, you're thinking of Pegas Pegasus. Unicorns are just the horn. We could totally genetically engineer unicorns, like, probably today if we could really buckle down. Yeah, I mean, okay. Okay, let's do another example. So, there's never been confirmed contact with an alien civilization, therefore we are alone in the universe. Fallacy or not a fallacy? Fallacy, why? The universe is so big that it's just unjustifiable. Is that what you're gonna say? That's, that's right, I mean, yeah, basically, this is, so in this case, again, this is like the extrasolar planets before the 1990s. We're currently in a situation where if there were other civilizations around other stars, the likelihood is that we wouldn't have found out about it yet, right? If you look at like how far we've, we've looked into the universe and in how much detail, it's, it's completely plausible that they're there and we just haven't observed them yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so if anybody was even, you know, sending us a, a message in a bottle, it's going to take a while to get here. I mean, that's, that's true of the further, that's, that's true of like billions of light years away. It's, it's not true of like our, so even in our galaxy. So suppose, suppose the claim is, is more restricted here. Let's suppose we're saying there's never been confirmed contact with an alien civilization in our galaxy. Therefore, we're alone in our galaxy. That's, that's not constrained by the speed of light. You know, light can cross our galaxy in a relatively short amount of time. But it's still true that, like, we haven't observed any. But I think that this is an appeal to ignorance because just like extrasolar planets, you know, 10, 20 years ago, more like 20 years ago, but uh, it's just very likely that we wouldn't know even if there was evidence, right? We don't have access to the relevant so there's no reasonable expectation that we would know if this was true, right? And that's what makes it a fallacy, right? Just appealing to the fact that you don't know something in cases where there's no reasonable expectation that you would know it is not evidence that that thing doesn't exist. Yeah? Yeah. So just to be picky, um, <laughs> both of these examples are appeals to ignorance, but this one is a fallacy. That's what I think. Yeah, I think this one's a fallacy, and the unicorn one was not a fallacy. Yeah. 
OK, let's do one more. So, and this one should be, I mean, I, I'm, una I'm unaware of any studies which show that climate, the climate is changing, so there's no reason to believe it is. Said in 2017. <laughs> like, clearly, your personal ignorance is not the issue, right? Just you not knowing something does not show that it doesn't exist. Right? So like, I, I haven't, by the way, I haven't looked at any studies. I haven't looked for them. I haven't Googled it. I haven't even begun the research project. But I'm unaware of any. Therefore, you can't convince me that it exists. That is a terrible, even if you think, like, even if you don't believe that climate change is real, you should, you should see that that's a terrible argument. Like, so if, you're a, if you don't believe that climate change is real, don't think I'm, I'm not attacking your worldview here. I'm just saying that's the wrong way of arguing for your position. Right? Like, that's a, that's a junk argument if I've ever seen one. I don't know anything about it because then you can, you can have a cultivated ignorance and just shield yourself for any, any information and just be totally confident about your world. In which kind of science? Climate. climate science. Well, I mean, okay, so if you had a degree in climate science, then you would have a reasonable expectation that you would be aware of evidence if it existed, right? Yeah. Right. So if you have a degree in climate science and then you say, I don't know of any, stu any such studies, uh, well, I don't know how you would have gotten your degree in today's world. But if that was true, if it was true, then it does begin to become evidence because you would have a reasonable expectation that if there was such a thing, you'd be aware of it, and you're not aware of it, so maybe that's evidence that it doesn't exist. Yeah? But isn't like the spirit of the argument, like as you said, like just the fact of not being aware of an individual, right. that individual being anybody, to right. kind of saying a universal claim, like for anybody who claims to not know something about climate science, it isn't the reasonable thing to conclude that <coughs> it's uh, not happening. Well, it it does it does depend on who you are. So if you're no if you're if you're a PhD in climate science and and you say this, that means something very different than if somebody has no education whatsoever, have no background. So the the, the reasonable what the key here is the reasonable expectation that they would be aware of the evidence if it existed. Okay, so it's context it is highly context dependent. All all of the all of this stuff is. So if you don't yeah if if you don't know that there's this evidence, and you're an ignoramus. That doesn't show much. But if you are unaware of the evidence, and you would if, you, if it existed, then it means something. Yeah? I was just going to say, couldn't you interpret this, I guess, more charitably? And maybe they mean that there's no valid studies and no studies that show meaningful change, or where the data is, sure. I guess, not manipulated to like the big group of climate change awareness, or sure. data is manipulated. Yeah, yeah. So that, that would be a, I well, so that would be, a, I think that would just be a different argument. It would just be a different argument. So if you say, I'm unaware of any reliable studies or highly uh, rigorous studies that show such and such, that's a, that's a different claim. So what you're claiming is, I know about the evidence, and I know that it's bad evidence. Uh, and that's a different claim than just like, I am simply unaware of the evidence. Uh, you could say the same kind of thing about like claims that Bigfoot exists. Like, there are lots of reports of Bigfoot. There's pictures. But I don't consider any of them reliable, so I don't accept them as evidence. So I'm unaware of any reliable reports of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or aliens. Right? Uh, so that seems to me, with at least Bigfoot and probably the Loch Ness Monster, to my mind, that's evidence that they don't exist, because there's no reliable reports. Aliens, as we just discussed, I'm less confident about that one. Because would we, would we actually know if they did exist? I'm not so sure. Yeah? OK, so when, when is it OK to appeal to ignorance? It's OK to appeal to ignorance precisely when uh, it's reasonable to expect there to be evidence about it if it existed. So unicorns are Bigfoot. We probably would have confirmed their existence by now if they existed. And this is not like a deductive proof. This is an inductive bit of reasoning. Uh, but sometimes appeal to ignorance are also just kind of rhetorical foot dragging. So one really annoying thing that people do very often in debate and discussion is say, well, I'm not aware of any such studies. You need to educate me. And 
that's not really a logical fallacy. That's just more of being a jerk, right? If you're like something that the person should definitely know about and they're just kind of feigning ignorance or remaining comfortable in their own ignorance, uh, they're not really making a fallacy exactly. They're just dragging their feet in the discussion, which is a slightly different, right? So you're not saying, in this case, you're not saying you should believe me because I don't know something. In that case, they're just saying, well, I don't know anything about this, so I don't believe you, or something like that. So keep those, keep those slightly separate, but for our purposes, appeal to ignorance is the fallacy. That's the one we're going to focus on. OK? Appeal to ignorance, fairly clear? Good. OK, here's another fun one. Slippery slope. So slippery slope fallacies are based on questionable conditionals. That is of the form, if x happens, then y will happen. And often they, there's a chain of conditionals. So then z will happen, and so on. So the hard part, and once again, like, once again, this is why it's so unhelpful to name fallacies in a discussion. So if you tell somebody, oh, that's a slippery slope fallacy, they'll say, no, it's not, because I believe the conditional. So the hard part here is separating true conditionals or reliable conditionals from false conditionals or unreliable conditionals. Right? So the, the hard part is figuring out when x leads to y leads to z reliably. Calling it a slippery slope is to say x doesn't really lead to y, y doesn't really lead to z. Yeah? Okay. So here's uh, good old Ben Carson. If you change the definition of marriage for one group, what defense do you have for the next group that comes along and wants to change? The Republican presidential candidate asked radio host Eric Metaxas on Thursday. Can you say, oh no, we're just changing it for one group and it'll be this way forever? How is that fair? It just doesn't make sense. If you change the definition of marriage for one group, what defense do you have for the next group that comes along and wants it changed? Okay, so fallacy or not a fallacy. What he's saying is, this is in the context of gay marriage, he's saying, if you allow gay marriage, then people will demand the right to, for example, have uh, multiple marriages, so polygamous marriages, for example, or they'll demand the right to marry their dog, something like that. Slippery slope, or like, is the, and the question is, is this slope really slippery or not? Yeah. I think it is because it doesn't necessarily entail that you have to keep making combinations in one group. Right, right. That's that's my personal opinion as well. Uh, so. But this is like, so I agree with you. I think that this, I mean, we, uh, in Canada, we legalized gay marriage some time ago. Currently, nobody's allowed to marry their dog. So it doesn't, at least it doesn't seem to have gone directly to bestiality or polygamy or whatever, right? So it wasn't a fast slippery slope at the very least. Uh, the way to intervene on this debate, uh, this sort of quotation, so the thing that I would point out here is, uh, can you say we're just changing it for one group? Oh no, we're just changing it for this one group and it'll be this way forever. As though that you can't offer further reasons down the line. Say, no, you can't marry your dog because dogs aren't people. That's different than ma marrying your, your gay husband because your gay husband is a person. Like, that further reasons couldn't be introduced into the discussion seems to be the error that he's making, to my mind. <laughs> right. Like it wasn't a way forever, and now, but now it has to be a way forever. Well, he's he's he's. Kind of well, he well, he's saying that's unreasonable too. What he's saying is, you we've got the ball rolling now, and once it's rolling, you can't stop it rolling. You can't just say, oh no, we just changed it for this group. Now we're not going to change it for your group or whatever. Well, as an African American, we're trying to get rid of segregated marriage and whatnot. But <laughs> as a as a all right, okay, yeah. Well, we're in, we're in a range here where people might seriously disagree about this one. Uh, people might seriously disagree about whether this slope is slippery or not. So I don't want to like legislate for you what you should think about this specific issue. I think it's a slippery slope fallacy. But that depends on what you actually believe is going to be the consequences of legalizing gay marriage. And I'm not, I'm not Nostradamus. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. So. Okay, 
that's a slippery slope fallacy. That's a real. That's a clear slippery slope fallacy, right? Because. So that's, that's, that's what a slippery slope is, though. So what you're saying is x will lead to y, or, and then y will lead to z, or something like that, when the causal connection is not real. Like those are, that's a bad example of a slippery slope, I would say. Why? Why? The example that I was giving. Oh, that you gave. No, that was a perfect example of a slippery slope. Well, that's in the sense that it's the slippery slope fallacy. right? So the fallacy is when you tell somebody that the slope is slippery and it's not. Some, some slopes really are slippery, like, no. yeah? This is a disclaimer. I'm, not, I'm entirely interested as to whether or not this is a slippery slope fallacy, but okay. um, it seems to me that, for instance, someone who's advocating for political clarity could use this example to strengthen their claim. They would say something like, um, oh, well, you know, um, the homosexual community, for instance, um, gay marriage is stigmatized back in the day, attitudes have changed. Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Lifestyle, thank you. Yeah. Lifestyle um, isn't legitimate. Yeah. I mean, so that would be a that would be a bit of evidence for thinking that this is a genuinely slippery slope that is not a fallacy. That what he's pointing out is a genuine slippery slope. Now, usually people take this, and not usually, but often they take it to the next step and say like, ah, now we're gonna marry dogs and cats, or you're gonna marry your waifu pillow, and like this will this will continue indefinitely till the point where marriage is you can anybody can marry anything so to polygamy I actually think you've got a really good point there like I don't I don't personally see the argument against multiple marriage in 2017 but you know yeah but the difference is like dogs and cats is that marriage is that it, 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 marriage in its definition is, is the, the union of two persons right so but uh, animal rights activists argue for including Animals in the category of persons. How would you know if the dogs and cats? Oh, well, you can tell. I mean, you can just tell. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not coming to bat for bestiality in this class. Uh, <laughs> so, no to unicorns. No to bestiality. That's my lesson to you all. All right. Yeah. Um, so for a slippery slope fallacy, yep. you have to have a series of inferences, I guess, right? Mm. In this case, so you. So the tip. The, the standard textbook uh, case is. A, a series, a chain. So if you allow gay marriage, you're going to have to allow multiple marriage, and then you're going to have to allow bestiality. Uh, I think you can have the same basic structure in just a one conditional. So X will lead inevitably to Y. So in that case, for I guess any, um, to, to prove any claim as a slippery slope, even if it's a series, you can just prove um, one contentious link in the series, and that would Exactly. Exactly. So in any yeah, in any link, any series of conditionals, x leads to y, y leads to z. Any if you can show any one of the links doesn't work, then you've shown that it's a slippery slope fallacy. Was there more on this? Okay. So here's one that's been on my mind. Uh, if you don't confront fascism early, it can grow out of control and overthrow democracy. I really would like to know if that's a slippery slope fallacy or not. Yeah. Well, I don't know if like my example is too extreme, but like, I mean, is, is it more extreme than the news? Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it is still more extreme. Okay. Like the Nazi Party, isn't that how they got to power? That is how they got to power. So yeah, they the fascism started off and then they took over and they overthrew democracy. <laughs> like that, yeah, that's totally how it went in that case. He was elected, but then he decided to dismantle the democratic system. Yeah. But in that particular case, where Mary Ellen just decided to contribute to the overthrow of democracy, he was elected, yes. Right. Um, but even before Hitler came into power, wasn't the government trying to suppress him in his movement? Uh, I believe they were, yeah. Right, so yeah. They jailed him, they jailed his companions. Yeah. yeah. So they confronted fascism, which is after his death. They it, it overcame, yeah. Yeah. So. Did it? Uh, well, Italy is where it started. The fat, yeah, the fascist movement. Yeah. Right. It seems like a pretty reasonable argument. Right. It's a weak, yeah, it's a weak conclusion. Can. 
uh, it can grow out of control and overthrow democracy. That's comforting. Huh. So when you say it can, does that kind of enable like supremacies to like uh, for, for for that to be um, like an all right argument? When you say it can, you're kind of allowing some kind of leeway yeah. to any kind of weak indications are acceptable as supremacies to make this argument sound. We're talking about when when we're talking about something like this, I think we're, we're implicitly have in mind some kind of probability. So if you're saying it can grow out of control and overthrow democracy, it implies that you think that that's a, a substantial possibility or it's a substantial probability, but the can kind of weakens the conclusion and say, look, I'm not telling you that this always is gonna happen. It's just like a substantial possibility or something like that. So yeah, you can, you can weaken your, or may or can or might would all weaken the conclusion and therefore make it easier to establish. So it's easier for this to not be a fallacy because the conclusion has been weakened by that sort of softening word. I very much hope that this is a slippery slope fallacy and that this isn't gonna, we're not gonna descend into fascism. That'd be great. Okay, this one's too grim for you. You like the unicorns better, I can tell. <laughs> okay, here's one more. Uh, you cannot keep accumulating debt on credit cards or else eventually you'll hit the limit and have an unreasonable amount of debt. Slippery slope or not? So, sorry, I should say slippery slope fallacy or not? If it's their limit, how is it unreasonable? <laughs> You're deeply mistaken about credit. Yeah. I'm sorry. You can absolutely get yourself into unreasonable amounts of credit card debt. I don't know about the system in the States. I know that you can get yourself too deep into credit card debt to the point where it's no longer reasonable. <laughs> it, the bank thinks it's reasonable because you owe them a lot of money at a lot of interest. But from your perspective, it's probably, it, it is entirely possible. I assure you it's entirely possible to get yourself into unreasonable amounts of credit card debt. So I would say this is not a slippery slope fallacy. This is a genuine slippery slope. If you continue to accumulate credit card debt, like if your debt is getting bigger and bigger, eventually it will get to the point where it's at an unreasonable level and you can't pay it back, right? So this is a genuinely slippery slope. It's not a slippery slope fallacy. All of these are very anxiety producing examples. I wish I'd, I'd, wish I'd chosen less nerve-wracking examples. Okay, so hopefully it's fairly clear. Those are all the examples, but it's only a fallacy if the slope isn't actually slipper, slippery. That is, if x really is likely to lead, the, lead to y, then saying x leads to y is not a fallacy, right? But if x only possibly leads to y or the connection is improbable, it's only a very weak connection, then it is a fallacy. Yeah? So you know how you said that? It can be just like uh, x causes y. Yeah. But it turns out that let's say x does not cause y. Hmm. So um, what determines whether it's like a slippery slope fallacy or simply um, irrelevant or um, or inadequate, for example? Um, ah, it's a it's a gray area. Like again, these categories are of limited use to tell you the truth. So there's not much that hangs on whether something is actually, a so in the case of just like if x then y and that conditional is false, if you want to call that a slippery slope that, that works, usually people use it to refer to chains of reasoning. So if x then y, if y then z, if z then a. Uh, if you want to call it just a bad conditional, that's fine too. Nothing, again, nothing really hangs on whether something falls under one of these categories or not. And what I'm trying to show you with these examples is that just seeing the structure, the formal structure of the argument is not sufficient to tell you whether it's a fallacy or not. Right? So this is where formal reasoning lets us down, right? Just knowing the formal structure of the argument, just saying, ah, this is an argument of the form, if x then y, if y then z, x therefore z. Aha, I've got the formal structure of the argument. You still have to figure out whether it's a fallacy or not. Right? You have to understand the content of it and the context before you can tell whether it's a slippery slope fallacy or not. 
So this is why we have a whole class on informal reasoning, and we don't just all send you all to deductive logic. Right. Okay. Good on slippery slope? Good. So now we're going to take a couple of, uh, deal with a couple of causal fallacies. I think I've got three or so. Uh, do you want to take a five minute break or power through? I heard both five minute break and power through murmured. Uh, yeah, we, okay, we've got three more causal fallacies and they're not, I'm not going to do like a whole bunch of examples of them because I think they're fairly straightforward. Let's, let's power through and then we'll take a break and do just a couple of exercises, same as last time. I'll just show you things and we'll talk about them. All right, so quickly power through. So anytime an argument is based on a false causal attribution, obviously it contains an error. And the way, the number of ways that you can get causality wrong are myriad. So here's one post hoc, ergo propter hoc. It's often called just the post hoc fallacy. So literally after the fact. Uh, so the Latin, this is Latin for after the fact, therefore because of the fact. So it's clearly not the case that if one thing precedes it, another, that it is necessarily the cause. So if you infer that the yellow light coming on caused the red light to come on, you're deeply mistaken about how lights work. Right? It's the mechanism inside that caused it to turn on. Uh, Similarly, I wore this sweater the day my team won the championship, so it's my lucky sweater. Simply not a good inference because there's no causal connection between the two, right? So just because one thing came before the other doesn't mean it caused it. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm not going to, yeah, like, is that, hopefully this isn't mysterious to any of you. Like, this should all be fairly straightforward, yeah? Okay. But know, I guess know the name of these things. So if somebody called, tells you you committed the post hoc fallacy, that's what they're talking about. Uh, attributing causation to mere correlations. So did you know uh, global warming, the rise in global temperature, is strongly correlated with the decline in Caribbean sea piracy? Here's a graph. Here's the number of pirates graphed against average global temperature. As you can see, there's a clear linear correlation. This is declining number of pirates, as by the way, and increasing temperature. A strong and clear correlation between the reduction in piracy in the Caribbean and increases in global temperature. Therefore, pirates keep the climate cool. Okay. Valid. valid totally valid. Accept that belief and you'll be fine. You'll just be totally fine. All right. So obviously correlations do not equal causation, even if it's a nice clear correlation, like even if it's a really strong correlation, simply not always true that the two are causally related. Uh, one of the reasons for this can be what's called the common cause fallacy. So two things can be systematically related, but one is not necessarily the cause of the other. So sometimes they can have a common cause. The example I picked here is anytime I start to get a cough, my nose is also stuffed up. So causing must be causing my sinuses to get blocked. Clearly, it's not the co coughing that's blocking your sinuses. It's the fact that you've got an illness, which is causing both. And there's one common cause underlying both roots. Yeah? I mean, causal reasoning, I think that's pretty much all I have for causal fallacies. Causal reasoning is unbelievably complex. You can't observe causes, you can only ever infer them. Like, you don't see the causation in the world, you just see things happening and try to figure out what's causally related to what. And that's no easy task. Scientists and philosophers are still arguing about exactly how to detect causality in the world. So actually getting into the details of how do you figure out if something caused another thing is like one of the great ongoing human projects. However, that's all I'm going to teach you today because, you know, we're not going to like do all of science in this class. Uh, essentially, causal fallacies involve getting the causes wrong. We're attributing causation, uh, attributing causation where there is none or attributing the wrong cause. Straightforward? I mean, this level should be straightforward. Getting into the actual details of when something causes another is like, see all of science and much of philosophy of science. All right. So now let's really take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break. And then I'm just going to do, I think I have like five short things for you to look at and talk about. <laughs>